Exam was a straight madness. Um, I ain't filmed here in a while. Um, vlog 166. Uh, you know, it's it's coming closer to the end now. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try and do some extra stuff, exciting stuff for the vlogs. So the exam, the exam was okay. Um, uh, the multiple choice section, I had half an hour left. It was okay for that. I think they were quite easy to be honest. Then the first part, you know, only I didn't even get to like halfway before the first hour, and it's a two-hour exam. Um, some of the answers which are hard I got right, but then some of them, um, maybe I didn't read the question a couple of times, uh, specifically with like the internal resistance, I didn't take into account like the previous part of the question. But other than that, I think it was all right. So maybe altogether, I think I got a question wrong on the um, resistors in the solar panel thing and uh, something wrong on the pulley system with the tension and the MG M plus MG when it's all the pulley system and all that if you know what I'm talking about then you'll know it was quite, uh, kind of difficult so those are like the two questions I got wrong but I only got them wrong because like, I missed out a bit of information uh, so I might get some method marks anyway then the other stuff with the decay, the decay question at the start, that was okay. <clears throat> Moving on to two papers tomorrow. So I've got, um, I've got the D1 and M2. So I'm resetting M2. So uh, should be alright in that. D1, easy. Uh, I've got half an hour break in between them. Right now, I'm going to do an M2 and D1 2016 paper. Get the D1 definitions down. And then I'm going to do some training outside. Beautiful day. Nice time to be alive. Getting the veggies and the carbs and the fruits and veggies and the carbs, and the veggies, and the corn, and the veggies. Vlog 166. Today, I'm going to do some more biology revision, focusing on paper 2. And this is a part 1 uh, out of two part videos, so I'm just going to focus on section 5 and 6 today. So chapters 11 to 16. So section 5 and section 6. Uh, so I'm going to cover photosynthesis first, chapter 11, I'm just going to check my notes. So chapter 11, the couple of things that you do need to know, and that's the light dependent reaction and the light independent reaction. I have some posters on my wall, so I'll basically I'll just go and check the posters because that will probably describe it better. So there's this as the light dependent reaction LDR so basically we start here uh, we start here so this is photo system 2 step 1 photo excitation two photons come in and excite the magnesium in the chlorophyll so what ends up happening is a photo ionization where the two electrons are lost to replace these two electrons lost there is photolysis so water molecule breaks down into two electrons and a half O2 and then what happens after that is this primary electron acceptor is where these two electrons go to then these two electrons bounce down uh, they're like reduction and oxidation reactions in an electron transfer chain where they release photons of energy and this actually combines ADP and pi into ATP this is photophosphorylation. Then these two electrons then go down to photosystem one, where two more photons come in, excite it, then accepted by another primary electron acceptor, which is lost those two electrons to ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin loses those two electrons to NADP reductase, where NADP plus comes to get reduced, therefore making reduced NADP. 
Uh, yeah, so basically the whole point of this process is to make ATP and reduced NADP. And this is then used in the light independent reaction. So here is the light independent reaction. So we're starting here with three molecules of RUBP. So RUBP is rubulose bisphosphate. And we have three molecules there. Basically, look at the number of carbon atoms we have as well. So three times five is 15. Uh, step one, we add the three molecules of carbon dioxide. And then this combines with three molecules of RUBP with the enzyme Rubisco. Uh, then this basically creates six molecules of G3P. G3P then undergoes a process where this ATP that we made in the LDR, ATP and reduced NADP uh, then become ADP and pi and NADP again. So basically they lose their energy to make 6TP. And with this 6TP, triose phosphate, we can then use one of these molecules to use an organic compound like glucose or fatty acids or amino acids or nucleo, uh, nucleotides or fructose or whatever or using seeds or flowers and then what happens after that is one of them's lost then we have one uh, we have five molecules of tp still left so five times three 15 it's kind of back what we started with and to get five tp into three iubp again ATP is used up again to make ADP and pi and that's basically photosynthesis the two processes LDR and LIR that you need to know uh, the next one is respiration so there's uh, steps in respiration there's glycolysis there's a link reaction and the Krebs cycle and then finally oxidative phosphorylation I've also got them on the wall as well so here yeah. starting at the top with glycolysis so basically we start with a glucose molecule and then two atp molecules become adp and pi so we use that energy to phosphorylate this glucose so notice the phosphate on either side so phosphorylated glucose then splits into two TP molecules then we use four ADP and pi molecules convert them into ATP and two NADs become two reduced NADs in splitting this two TP into two pyruvate molecules so basically we've got glucose phosphorylated it splitting it and then by turning TP into pyruvate we've made four ATP and two NAD and that's glycolysis uh, basically glycolysis means the splitting up of glucose then we have the link reaction so what happens in the link reaction uh, we start with two pyruvates from the last thing and uh, then we can turn two NADs into two reduced NADPs and give off two carbon dioxide molecules by making one co-acetyl molecule just call it CoA and uh, basically it's this thing so it looks like a little semicircle that and that's what the link reaction does so basically the link reaction turns pyruvate into CoA making two reduced NADP molecules then moving on to step three the Krebs cycle so what is the Krebs cycle <clears throat> it is a cycle so basically we start with CoA uh, CoA added to a four carbon molecule then makes a six carbon molecule and by making NADP into two reduced NADP we can turn this into a five carbon molecule releasing two molecules of carbon dioxide and then we can move this into a four carbon again by releasing two more carbon dioxide molecules 
and making two reduced FADs by two FADs. This is one's quite confusing, so I checked the Krebs cycle out. Uh, basically, it just makes a four into a five and back into a four. This step is not really necessary. So basically, what you need to know, it moves from a four to a six to a five to a four, all that time making two reduced NADPs and releasing four carbon dioxide molecules. Finally, is the oxidative phosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation, there, I don't know if you can see that one, but basically what happens here is we start with uh, NAD uh, and NADH2, so basically reduced NADH2, and basically what happens here, the first step, Hydrogen ions are pumped through the membrane and this happens, this whole thing happens in the cristae of uh, mitochondria basically. It's kind of under the radiator so I'm going to pick it up. Basically, I'll uh, tell you what happens, start again. So basically hydrogen, hydrogen ions are pumped through the membrane, uh, through the cristae membrane of the mitochondria. A reduced NAD uh, turns into NAD and hydrogen. And then these two hydrogen ions go through this protein one. So it's reduced and then it's oxidized almost straight away by the second protein. And then this happens again with the third and the fourth. So these hydrogen ions keep on going up through the membrane, increasing the concentration of hydrogen on this side. Then finally, this these two electrons then combine uh, with this oxygen that we have. So the oxygen basically acts as the terminal electron acceptor. Whilst this is happening, there's a diffusion gradient now through ATP synthase uh, that we have this enzyme, the final thing. So basically all these hydrogen ions then come through here and this makes, combines ADP and pi into ATP. Simple as and some other things just need to know. So here pH is 8 up here pH is like 5 because there's more hydrogen and uh, that's oxidative phosphorylation and that's uh, that's the whole of respiration really that you need to know so the next thing that's chapters 11 and 12 done already so the next thing is nitrogen cycle uh, it's a bit uh, vague about what kind of questions they can ask you but this is the nitrogen cycle uh, right there so basically what happens is there's some combinations with nitrogen ions and the animals that actually use it, the organisms. So if we say, if we start with, we start here, there's, we start saprobionts. So basically the stuff on the ground, the like uh, bacteria and stuff, this causes ammonitrification. Ammonification into NH4 plus ions, ammonium ions, then nitrification to nitrite ions, NO2 minus, then nitrification again to nitrate ions. Then this can be denitrified by, de uh, by nitrogen fixing bacteria and lightning into N2, so this is a standard nitrogen molecule. Uh, but also, what can happen? is from the nitrate ions they get absorbed by producers uh, then they assimilate by consumers so basically consumers eat it and then consumers decompose uh, and then they get digested by saprobionts so basically the theme is uh, stuff digests it like organisms dead stuff uh, they uh, decompose dead animals and stuff then they kind of nitrify it nitrify and nitrify it and then they can denitrify it just to make a standard nitrogen molecule. So saprobionts, they digest via excreting, secreting enzymes extracellularly. Um, there was a question in the paper one, and it said, what's an advantage of digesting enzymes extracellularly? So basically, if we just put enzymes out through our mouth onto food before eating it, and I put... Um, you can eat food at the same time as digesting something else or I think I put uh, I also put 
you can by doing that you can uh, eat more food than you are digesting is that the same thing on oh, no, you can uh, digest more food than carrying space in your body so I don't know the actual answer for that um, but anyways the nutrient take up by producers and there's incorporates into complex molecules then eaten by consumers then continues in a food chain organisms die saprobionts break down releasing a nutrient so new nutrient cycle uh, in nitrogen next phosphorus cycle but there's like an equation net production equals the ingested takeaway uh, feces urine and respiratory losses so that's the net production of nitrogen but phosphorus cycle uh, it's a bit bit easier to understand so that's the phosphorus cycle so we have some basically we've got some animals we also got some rocks and uh, dead animals so basically what happens is uh, there's no gaseous phase so uh, phosphate ions are in sediment we have producers we got consumers so if producers feed consumers so like a rabbit eats a plant and then they excrete this eventually goes to the oceans uh, then this can be absorbed by plants in the water etc uh, but then consumers die so then they're left in the bowls, bones and shells then these erode back into the oceans or if the bones and shells are de deposited cemented together they make sediment rock and then this goes into the oceans so basically everything goes into the ocean everything goes into the ocean uh, then there's something called eutrophication no replacement of ions forces crops and goes into rivers uh, no replacement of ions for crops and the ions go into rivers basically so that's how uh, crops can lack in minerals so you know they might look all white for example there's like this crop and if it doesn't get a specific element it goes all white it will be still be the same it just a different color and maybe lack some vitamins <clears throat> next moving on sharply to chapter 14 response so there's a simple uh, chain stimulus response coordinator effector response simple as they might ask you that like two mark one mark or maybe in uh, IAQA they might just make you do it for fun uh, and then there's basically what this does is uh, reflex art promotes survival so basically if someone survives after doing something so let's say I had uh, a response to as soon as someone came near me punch them in the face that would be a response so basically this would promote survival therefore the alleles for this gene would be passed on and the people who don't punch them in the face they get killed or whatever so they don't get to pass on their genes and then we have three types of movement in organisms so taxis number one taxis simple response where direction determined by stimulus so a taxis can be like photo taxis so animals move towards light because that's the stimulus so taxis a simple response with the direction is directed by stimulus determined by stimulus then number two kinesis kinesis uh, they do not move away or towards the stimulus but changes the rate at which it changes direction so you might see cockroaches uh, they might just walk in circles uh, there might be water somewhere there might be um, uh, light somewhere so they might want to stay in the middle of a temperature so they just go around in circles so repeating kinesis is the they do not move away or towards the stimulus but changes the rate at which it changes direction thirdly tropism so plants do this it's a growth of a plant in response to a directional stimuli growth of a plant in direction response to a stimuli so there's, there's three types that I have written down light so shoots have positive phototropism moving towards light and roots have negative phototropism moving away from light then there's gravitropism so shoots have negative uh, 
gravitropism, so the, the leaves and stuff, they don't go towards the gravity. And then roots have a positive gravitropism. Finally, there's water, so roots have positive uh, hydrotropism. Then there's something you need to know called IAA. I think it's called indyloacetic acid. And it's just um, a chemical. That's all you need to know. Or indylacetic auxin. No, indylacetic acid, definitely. So basically, it's a chemical in shoots. And the molecules move to the opposite side of the sun. So if this is a plant, the sun's here. This is a plant. The molecules move to this side, so the elongation in this side increases. So basically, wherever IAA goes, there's more cell elongation there. So if there's more elongation here, less here, it ends up curving towards the sun. Better for photosynthesis. Uh, in in roots, it's uh, in roots. There's a high concentration in the root meri stem. So it's kind of in the middle, in the root or at the bottom. So um, it reduces, if there's too much, like I didn't get this at the start, but if there's too much IAA, it actually reduces cell elongation. It's like there's too much, so nothing happens. And there's an acid growth hypothesis too. So basically, um, hydrogen ions are pumped out from the cytoplasm into the cell walls. And apparently this increases plasticity in the walls uh, because of a lower pH or whatever. So there's more cell, cell elongation because of this. Uh, quick uh, recap on a reflex arc. So to, by, avoiding, by avoiding an injury by reflex, um, they're more likely to survive and pass on their genes. But the path is stimuli, receptor, sensory neuron, coordinator, relay neuron, motor neuron, effector response and uh, you just need to know that so basically there's receptors as well for a specific stimuli so they're also called transducers which convert different forms of energy um, so basically there's cells that convert different forms of energy into electrical energy because that's how the body can read stuff you know we're electric we're robots uh, there's something called the Pacinian corpuscle, so it's a type of tissue and basically it's mechanical stimuli when applied, when pressure is applied, so my finger, press them together, Pacinian corpuscles, mechanical stimuli activated. And when this happens, stretch mediated cells open, stretch mediated sodium channels open, so this causes uh, a resting potential from minus 70 megavolts, uh, minivolts, millivolts to zero millivolts, and this is a generator potential. So basically, what happens as I apply pressure, mechanical pressure, sodium channels open, and sodium is positive. So the resting potential from one side of the membrane is minus 70. I've opened the passages now, so Na can go in. And this reduces the minus 70 to a zero, so it creates a kind of a wave, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So basically a Pacinian corpuscle is a sensory neuron in the middle, and then there's other layers of lamellae around it. Yeah, so then we have a different type, we have the eyes, and we're talking about the cells in the eyes. So there's two types, we have rods and we have cones. Uh, rods are usually black and white cones of a color. So rods, they have something called spatial summation. So basically loads of rods can give a signal to one bipolar cell. And uh, the difference between that and cones is it's usually one cone cell to one bipolar cell. So when you spatially summate, uh, you can combine the uh, potentials of loads of different rod cells. So if you have 20, just a random unit, 20, 20, and 20 together to make 60, if that's the action potential potential needed to make an impulse. But in cones, uh, it's either one to one. So it needs the full 60, you know what I'm saying? Like just to compare. So also with rods, 
Uh, they're more near the periphery of the retina, so near the edges of the eye. And they have low visual acuity, so they less resolution, less definition. And uh, they're sensitive to low light, so like black and white when it's dark. And th there's only one type of these rod cells, compared to cones which have temporal summation, which is, like I said, they're discrete, so they need one. And... Uh, they can be used repeatedly. Uh, they're more in the center of the eye, the fovea, which is very sensitive to um, high, it's sensitive to high level light, uh, high intensity light, and it has high visual acuity, high definition, and there's three types, RGB for the three different colors. Yeah, and that's basically how it is. There's a diagram that you kind of need to know of the diagram of where they are in the eye. And that's basically what it is. So if you have a look at that, pause it or whatever. Basically, the black shaded stuff is... What's that? Rod, uh, cones. Cones and then rods around the outside. So for Vera, where the, it's where the cones are for the highlight. And then, can you see the blind spot as well? The blind spot is where the nerve actually goes, so the optic nerve in the eye, so there can't be any eye cells there. Moving on, moving on now to the heart and how the heart impulses. So there's something called the SAM, I think it's called the synovial atrium, atrial nerve. Or something like that, don't quote me on that, but it's just need to know it's the SAN. So the SAN actually emits a wave of electrical excitation to the atrium muscle. So if you think about the heart, atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle. So the SAN actually puts a wave of excitation to the atrium muscles to contract and uh, there's non-conductive tissue in the middle of the left and the right side of the heart so then the signal doesn't pass on so this uh, basically the signal does not go to the ventricles so it stays at the atrium and doesn't go to the ventricles and then there's a short uh, then it finally meets the avn between the atrium so another point of the uh, AVN in the middle between atria there's a short delay you just gotta say there's a short delay I don't know why it's like two marks or whatever there's a short delay and then a wave of electrical excitation ha occurs for the ventricles so then the ventricles they're through specialized fibers called perkine fibers uh, or the bundle of his so the the transmission the wave goes down through there to the heart and then through the bundle of his and then to the two ventricles so the ventricles contract bottom up uh, at the same time and very quickly so i think the sans here uh, wave of contraction goes to the avn there's a short delay and then that emits a wave of electrical excitation going down the bundle of his and then to the ventricles the ventricles contract quickly at the same time and that's basically how the heart contracts and there's two types of nervous system so there's the sympathetic nervous system which speeds up activity compared to the parasympathetic system which slows down activity so if you think about the word uh, the root word of para so basically like think of it like paralympics or paraphrase or whatever para means like a slower or shorter version so para here means slows down activity compared to sympathetic which speeds up activity. So how do we control the heart? How do we make it beat faster? Or how do we make it beat slower? That's kind of an interesting question. So basically, how, how can you detect? You've got to think about it. What's the transducer? What energy can you possibly convert to make something happen? Like the heart doesn't have a brain of its own and we don't know if we want it to beat faster or slower. Uh, unless we wanted to, but then could we control it? No, because it's a kind of a reflex and it's part of the brain that we don't need to think about. Uh, so, when there's a high concentration of carbon dioxide, uh, the pH in our blood goes down or in respiring tissue, the pH goes down because there's more carbon dioxide because there's more respiration there. 
because we're doing more energy, more exercise. So then chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries, in the wall of the aorta, detect this. So frequency of impulses to the medulla oblongata in the brain increase. So uh, which frequent, more frequent impulses to the SAN in the heart via the sympathetic nervous system which causes wave excitation to increase to the avian so the atria and ventricles contract quicker then the co2 levels concentration in those respiring tissues decreases because the blood is then removed it's taken to the lungs so then the carbon dioxide is removed placed with oxygen so then it detects the carotid uh, chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries detect that the pH has then gone lower. So then the frequency of impulses uh, to the medulla oblongata decreases. So the frequency of impulses to the SAN then decreases. So then the heart rate then decreases. So it's kind of a whole process that you need to know as it increases and then decreases. So it's all via the chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries in the aorta so there's also another way of detecting um, this and changing heart, heart rate control and there's pressure so there's pressure receptors in the carotid arteries uh, so they can make the frequency of impulses go up and down to the medulla oblongata so they send messages via the sympathetic or parasympathetic system so the SAN fr frequency of impulses goes up or down relatively. So then the heart rate goes up and down relatively. So it's the same kind of thing except pressure receptors or chemoreceptors or whatever. Now, chapter 15. So I've only got, I've only got two more chapters left. And that's almost everything you need to know for paper 2. So chapter 15, the nervous system or nerves or whatever so basically the difference between a nerve comparing a nerve to a hormone uh, nerves are fast hormones are slow nerves are specific hormones are general nerves are impulse hormones are from a gland nerves have a generator potential hormones are longer lasting nerves are via neurons and short lasting whereas Hormones are via the blood, humoral. So basically, what does a nerve cell look like? This diagram. There. That's basically a nerve, a badly drawn uh, drawing of nerve. So basically, what happens is there is kind of a line going through. Uh, and basically, there's a myelin sheath, kind of like sausages around it. And there's at the end a dendritic cell with dendrons on it. Uh, so basically what you need to know, the myelin sheath around it actually increases conduction. There's better insulation and it's made of Schwann cells. So Schwann cells actually protect the nerves and help protect it via phagocytosis. The nodes um, in between the nerve cells covered by the myelin sheath are called nodes of Ranvier, by the way, just in case you're wondering. And then we have uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how a nerve action potential, how a nerve impulse happens. And I've got four steps here, four steps. So there's a diagram as well, just so you can look at that first before... I describe what happens. So at the top we have action potential, then we got some rest resting potential, then we got some hyperpolarization. But what do these mean? What do these mean? We have four steps. Step one: uh, the sodium potassium pump uh, is kept at resting potential, so minus seventy millivolts, and that's just how that's just how it is. So there's a high concentration of potassium here uh, or sodium and potassium on either side of a membrane and it's kept so it's a minus 70 millivolts resting potential that's all you need to know step two stretch mediated uh, sodium channels open up so these channels open up in the membrane 
So then the sodium diffuses to the other side, and a K goes to the other side too. Uh, the so, so then when these channels open, this actually also influences other sodium voltage-gated channels to open as well. So it's kind of a positive feedback. Uh, so then this increases the amount of sodium in inside the membrane. So uh, this happens via facilitated diffusion. So basically what happens is it's at resting potential. Stretch mediated channels open, which also increases the voltage gated channels to open. So then more sodium comes in and you can guess what happens. The potential reaches zero millivolts, like I was saying before. So minus 70 millivolts becomes zero millivolts now. And this is all that's needed for an action potential. And you can tell what that means. So action means something's going to happen. So then what happens is um, once this action potential is re re uh, reached, um, it kind of sends like an, an impulse all the way down the nerve axon. And uh, basically this occurs when the threshold is reached. And they like to say threshold uh, voltage or threshold potential uh, as a keyword. Uh, so then what happens after this, after the action potential is reached, there is the potassium ch channels open, uh, then the potassium moves in via facilitated diffusion until hyperpolarization. So instead of uh, going back to minus 70 millivolts, it goes even further, so minus 80 or whatever. Uh, then after this hyperpolarization, they all close off, um, all close off, and then the sodium potassium pump restores it back to the original resting potential, to the repolarization. So we look, if we look at that graph again, have a look at that graph. Basically, what happens is, it starts here, then we've we've had some stimuli, so it goes up to the action potential, goes tiny bit above it or something or maybe it goes a tiny bit above it and then it goes down all the way past the resting potential to hyperpolarization and then it goes back to the resting potential eventually so a couple of things notes I wrote down about this so it travels like a wave through the neurons depending on the temperature the myelin sheath and the diameter of the axon and uh, there's actually a refractory period so basically after an action potentials occurred the time it takes for that graph for it to go up then down then there it's kind of like a heartbeat on the monitor the time for that to happen is the ref it, that is like one time for it to happen so you have to wait until that's happened to have another one and another one the time in between is actually called the refractory period the time until you can have a, another action potential and um this ensures that the action potential occurs in one direction and the discrete impulses, so it's kind of binary, like yes or no, you're getting an impulse or not, so the brain can identify it more easily. And this actually limits the action potential, so it prevents shock or whatever. Now there's another thing called uh, basically how this happens, but across a synapse, so across in between like two nerves in between two nerves there's like a synapse a gap and you need to know how the it gets across the gap basically it's kind of a simple process I've got nine steps here maybe not simple but it's nine simple steps and it's basically from the pre synaptic knob across the gap to the post synaptic knob so the start of the new nerve axon from the old from the old axon. So step one, the action potential has occurred at the terminal axon. Then here, voltage gated calcium two plus channel channels open. So voltage gated calcium ions channels open here. So I mean, uh, so basically if we start that again, let me start that again. So basically this is the nerve axis on the end okay then an action potential is reached voltage gated calcium channels open in here so calcium then enters from the sides not from we're here like I was saying from the sides they come in 
and then these calciums give signals to vesicles. Vesicles then move to the ends of this nub, the ends of this nub. And the vesicles combine with the presynaptic neuron membrane, releasing acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So basically after that it's combined with the membrane released acetylcholine and these diffuse quick because there's a short diffusion pathway and this binds to receptors on the post synaptic neuron and this causes sodium channels to open and this changes the shape of the membrane so the sodium channels open and allows sodium diffusion in via facilitated diffusion and uh, this generates a new action potential and then acetylcholine is recycled so it doesn't generate a new action potential so the action potential remains discrete and then afterwards the sodium channels close so then the, basically to sum that up sum that up quickly sodium um, sodium causes an action potential here then calcium channels are allowed inside they diffuse in they then combine uh, signal a vesicle to move to the ends of the membrane which combines the end of the membrane releasing acetylcholine diffuses across to and combines with receptors which are complementary on the postsynaptic neuron and then this opens sodium channels here so then sodium can come in and make a new action potential and then uh, acetylcholine then moves back via ATP basically to sum it up it's kind of a weird thing to think about then basically if uh, some new there's actually some no neurons that make it less likely for an action potential to occur and uh, basically this happens if um, you know if you've trained yourself to not feel pain or like if your boxer punching stuff over and over again and uh, this kind of happens so some neurons make it less likely for an action potential to occur so there's four steps, five steps in this one. So basically the presynaptic neuron releases a neuron transmitter binding to chloride channels on the post synaptic neuron. So then chloride channels open and move in via facilitated diffusion. So basically it also means that potassium channels open so potassium moves in uh, into the postsynaptic neuron as well, therefore making it more negative. So there's hyperpolarization, so there's less chance that an action potential is going to occur because even if the normal amount of sodium got in as well, it wouldn't be enough to make it positive. So to sum up again, basically what happens is a neurotransmitter binds to chloride channels on the, so basically if there's a presynaptic, um, it binds to chloride channels on the post. So then um, it just changes the shape of it. So then chloride channels open. Also, this helps uh, potassium ions to come in, making it more negative. So even if the action potential tried to happen, the sodium would come in and it just wouldn't be positive enough to make uh, an action potential. So it inhibits an action potential. Yeah, next, moving on to muscles. So there's different types, there's cardiac, there's smooth and there's skeletal. Uh, there's a single cell, not strong enough. So we have muscle fibers with one nucleus and a sarcoplasm. So I never knew this about muscle cells. They, a single cell is just not strong enough. So there's fibers with a nucleus and a sarcoplasm. And it looks like this. looks like this so you need to know there's a sarcomere this is a whole thing called a sarcomere kind of like the units of a muscle fiber and there's bands here you can check it more better like on a your diagram but this is my diagram and there's middle H zone then with the middle and these two things on the side it makes an A band uh, if we had then take the uh, bands here and here there's lines this makes the Z line and this end thing here is actually the I band and this thing here is a myofibril moving on to the actual structure of a muscle 
like this. So there's myosin. We have myosin here. There's actin filaments. And there's tropomyosin around it as well. So, wait, I think that diagram might be wrong. So I think these are the actin filaments. Oh, no, wait, that diagram's correct. That diagram's correct, what am I saying? So basically, what happens in a muscle contraction is... Uh, oh, okay, I'll move on to that in a sec. Okay, so there's two types of muscle, slow twitch and fast twitch. Slow twitch, slow contraction, lots of myoglobin, lots of mitochondria because it's aerobic. Then we have fast twitch, powerful contraction, moves uh, myosin filaments uh, and they're thicker. Concentration of glycogen goes up. Concentration of enzyme goes up for anaerobic respiration. Yeah, that's basically what happens. Uh, then how a muscle actually contracts. So when we have the wave of action potential when it goes to neuron now to a muscle so it's called the neuromuscular junction. So a wave of action potential occurs, it happens. So then calcium channels open, facilitated diffusion in, vesicles bind to the presynaptic membrane, release acetylcholine, bind to receptors on the sarcolemma. This time, not on the postsynaptic neuromembrane. They're actually binding onto the sarcolemma after diffusing across the cleft. Then sodium channels open on the uh, sarcolemma. Sodium channels move in as a part of a wave of action potential through the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, so more calcium ions bind to troponin and tropomyosin moves from the actin binding site. So basically after that's happened, after the sodium's gone in as a wave of action potential, these calcium ions come in again as they would do for the next wave, except this time they bind onto troponin and tropomyosin. So if you imagine a filament, there's a filament like this, it has a myosin head and there's a, a something here it has to attach to, just floating, like a cloud. So basically this myosin head has to attach to that cloud, but that cloud has something blocking it. So what happens is the calcium ions bind to the troponin and tropomyosin was blocking it so then what's blocking it moves out of the way so then there's a binding site now and then the myosin head binds to the actin filament binding site because they're complementary and a contraction occurs uh, then ATP binds to the myosin to recock it back to its original position ready for another contraction uh, and then ATP uh, that hydrolyzes ATP into ADP and pi, uh, then it can contract again. Uh, so basically what ATP used for in the muscle contraction is returning calcium back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum so the muscle can relax via active transport and also in the movement of myosin heads. Um, there's also phosphocreatine, so uh, when people take creatine supplements and stuff, what it's for is to help ATP restore, so basically more energy. Uh, just going through that again, because it can get confusing. So what happens is the calcium removes the tropomyosin uh, from the binding site on the actin filament. Uh, so the myosin head can bind, causes a contraction. ATP takes it back into the recocked position. Then ATP is hydrolyzed. So there's just pi here now, ADP is gone. Uh, so it can contract again and that keeps on happening. So when it contracts and contracts, that's that's how things happen. That's that's my left arm. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. So then after that, that's the whole topic for 15. 16, homeostasis. Homeostasis basically means, you know, GCSE, maintaining the internal environment. So I've literally got it here, maintenance of internal environment conditions kept at an optimum so humans trying to keep it at that optimum level it's quite interesting because uh, we don't really know that much about how it works uh, we've just got some notes about sugar kidneys uh, pancreas here as well so first of all I'm going to go through how glucose is controlled so they can ask you a lot about this a lot of processes here and when they say can you give a negative feedback uh, you know, in the final paper, 
in the essay question, give examples of ne negative feedback. This is an example of negative feedback. So when we have glucose, um, first of all, a bit of background. So in the pancreas, there's actually islets of Langerhans types of cells, alpha and beta cells. So if there's glucose, the glucose potential, uh, glucose concentration is very low in the blood. Receptors on alpha cells in the pancreas secrete glucagon, the hormone, causing liver cells to convert glycogon into glucose. So there's more in the blood now. And then blood goes all the way around, comes back to the pancreas, detecting an increase or the optimal amount, uh, optimal amount of glucose concentration. So then less glucagon is secreted. And uh, so basically this one keeps it uh, greater or above optimum level. Then if glucose concentration is too high in the blood, what do we do then? This is detected by receptors on the cell surface membrane of beta cells of the pancreas, which then secrete insulin, uh, converting glucose to glycogon. Uh, this is via the liver, which secretes the hormones. Uh, so then this c insulin converts glucose into glycogon, uh, which is stored in the liver. Then blood moves all the way back around. Pancreas detects, uh, pancreas detects a low glucose level. And then the insulin is less frequently released. And this includes the absorption of glucose into, into cells. Yeah, so basically it detects the glucose concentration is down and then insulin and glucose is absorbed into cells. Uh, also, temperature control. So we've got temperature control as well. So if the blood temperature is too high, thermoreceptors in the hypothalamus uh, more frequently impulse, give impulses to the heat loss center in the brain. So more frequently impulses occur to the skin for vasodilation. Uh, more sweat occurs, they lower the body hair, then, then the blood temperature decreases, detected by the hypothalamus, sends less impulses to the skin via the heat loss center, then the heat loss stops, or vasoconstriction occurs, so the arterial lumen, de lumen decreases, or if it's too, if it's, uh, too cold, then the hairs become erect, creating an insulating layer on the body. And then shivering occurs to generate heat. So there's two types of diabetes. Diabetes type 1, genetic, or diabetes type 2, when insulin is not made enough. <clears throat> then there's like three processes. And that's uh, number one, glycogenesis. Glucogenesis. Glycogenesis. Glycogenesis is making glycogen. So it's basically when glucose turns to glycogen. Uh, then we have glycogenolysis, breaking down glycogen. So glycogen turns into glucose. Then we have gluconeogenesis. So glucose is then made from glycerol and amino acids. So then we have another process, interesting, uh, second, secondary messenger. If they ask you a question in the exam saying, what's a good secondary messenger example, or even if in the 25 marker, they say talk about secondary messengers and stuff like that, here's a good one. So if there's low glucose concentration in the blood, the adrenaline is released from the adrenal gland, binding to the cell surface membrane receptors on liver cells, uh, changing the shape, and therefore activating adenal uh, cyclase. So it's an enzyme, and this converts ATP into CAMP, C-A-M-P. Uh, CAMP acts as a secondary messenger binding to protein kinase A, protein kinase A, and it changes the shape, uh, activating it. So then this catalyzes glycogon to glucose, leaving via facilitated diffusion into the blood. So it's kind of like a process, very uh, quick steps. Finally now, the kidneys. So I've got a diagram quickly as well. So that's what it looks like. So at the top left, 
got arterial, then some tubes, then some squiggles, and then the collecting duct. And right at the bottom right, there should be, you know, where urine comes out. So basically, I've got three steps written down. Three steps. Number one, ultra filtration resistance. So there's capillaries, capillary epithelium, connective tissue capillaries, Bowman's capsule capsules epithelium. Then we have hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule and osmotic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. And all of these things push back on anything that's coming in from the arterial but basically what happens is the arterial afferent arterial comes in and high pressure blood so it kind of forces everything through the Bowman's capsule wants to go into the glomerulus and uh, there's actually things called podocytes and this is an adaptation so podocytes cells with space in between them uh, between glomerular epithelium or be and between endothelium helps filter out more so this filtration leaves us with glomerular filtrate so recapping again so capillary epithelium connective tissue capillary uh, Bowman's capsule epithelium hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure in the Bowman's capsule all push back and prevent that uh, ultrafiltration then step two the uh, PCT standing for proximal convoluted tubule is the next thing it goes into so this thing and that's kind of squiggly and it absorbs 85% of water uh, so basically the aim of the kidneys is to reabsorb as much ions uh, that we need and water back that we need so it absorbs 85% of water back and it has many microvilli and infoldings at the base to go back to the capillaries and it has a high concentration um, of mitochondria for ATP so it can uh, actively transport uh, stuff back across the membrane it has many uh, protein channels for increased facilitated diffusion and active transport from the epithelium to the blood so stuff like co-transport of glucose and uh, sodium in from the lumen via facilitated transport uh, diffusion into the epithelium so also water potential uh, decreases when it takes the ions out so water follows it via osmosis next is the Lupa Venli Lupa Venli so we've got the Lupa Venli here the loop the Lupa Venli so Lupa Venli basically what happens is um, out of the ascending limb, descending, ascending. In the ascending limb, they all active transport out ions. So outside here, where there's loads of ions, there's low water potential. So when the descending limb comes down, uh, water moves out via osmosis from high water potential to low water potential in between there where there's blood capillaries and that basically goes back into the blood. Uh, but the actual ascending limb the reason why that water doesn't come out is because those uh, tubes are impermeable to water uh, except near the base where few sodium ions actually come out uh, therefore there is a higher water potential up here and a lower water potential down here therefore uh, when it goes round again to the collecting duct so basically what happens after that, it goes to the distal convolute tubule and then this goes into the collecting duct, the last thing. So you can see there's high water potential here now and low water potential here now. Because, because I explained that, loads of ions have been taken out here, loads of them. Uh, so there's low water potential here, but less as it goes up here because there's less ions to take out then what that means is as the water or that filtrate goes down into the car collecting duct finally is that it's called a counter current multiplier so every time the water goes down it meets um, water around it with less water potential 
So then more water comes out via osmosis every time. So even if uh, it lost loads of water here at the top, it's always going to meet more water with lower water potential. So more water will come out via um, osmosis. And this is the counter current multiplier. Um, constant osmotic gradient. And there's more osmos osmosis, so more water is absorbed. Uh, finally, last thing, last thing. How to control water in the blood. And I've got like eight steps here. So firstly, osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus shrink and release ADH to the posterior pituitary gland. So hypothalamus is the brain. So imagine in my brain, there's going to be water going up. There's something through my brain and there's osmoreceptors in there uh, detecting the water. So if there's low water, we're saying, assuming there's low water potential in my blood, then it releases ADH to the posterior pituitary gland. And this is then secreted through the capillaries to my kidneys. And then when they're at the kidneys, they bind to specific receptors on the cell surface membrane on cell walls of the collecting duct. So, so the ADH binds to receptors on the collecting duct. Then this activates phosphorylase, an enzyme, which means vesicles. So basically, collecting duct is here. Uh, ADH is just coming, bind to the collecting duct. And then uh, this activates phosphorylase. So phosphorylase is now in the collecting duct. And this actually uh, means vesicles then bind to the cell membrane. So this enzyme makes vesicles bind to the cell membrane, uh, making aquaporins more permeable. So little holes, more flexible, more uh, permeable. So more H2O is lost back into the capillaries. And the, however, there's a drawback. As more water is reabsorbed, you know, if someone's dehydrated, it also means you're more urea can actually also come out and urea is poisonous um, so it's like it's a kind it's a kind of like a, a drawback and also uh, more urea is lost so that's actually a solute so there's more urea is lost uh, it actually lowers the water potential outside so more water then comes out again so as water comes out urea comes out then more water comes out again uh, so the osmoreceptors frequency impulses increase to the thirst center in the brain and then they detect this rise in water potential, those osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. So then they send less frequent impulses to the posterior pituitary gland, so less ADH is released and the collecting duct normalizes and becomes normal, normally permeable again. And that's half of paper two. I'll do the rest tomorrow. And that's with talking about stuff like inherited exchange, uh, population genetics, the gene stuff, populations, uh, some more on cells and genes. And I'll do that tomorrow. More vlogs.